Hello, and welcome back for another Torah Tuesday. Today we're continuing our exploration of the early chapters of Genesis. We're picking up the storyline in Genesis chapter 4 with the account of Cain and Abel. Now at the end of chapter 3, we have a lot of questions. Adam and Eve have been kicked out of the garden. They've lost their access to the tree of life. And we're wondering, as readers, what will be the fate of humanity outside the garden? What will be the result of their knowing good and evil? And in the beginning of the story, we see a few encouraging signs. First of all, Eve is able to get pregnant, and she gives birth to a son. This is good news because it means that the human race will continue. She names her first son Cain, which is a play on words. Often naming scenes in Genesis introduce a play on words. And here, the, the name Cain, or Cain, seems to come from the verb kana, to get, and she got a son with the help of Yahweh. So that's why she names him Cain. But Cain also can mean spear, which could hint at the violence that we're going to see play out in this story. Her second son is named Hevel in Hebrew, or Abel, we usually see in our English translation. The narrator doesn't tell us why she names her second son Hevel, but it's interesting that Hevel means breath or vapor, and the book of Ecclesiastes uses Hevel as a, as a way of capturing the transience of life, the transience of the meaning of life. You can't grasp it or hang on to it. It disappears, and that is indeed what will happen to this second son in the story. He won't last long. But, but I'm getting ahead of myself uh, because there are more encouraging signs in the beginning of the story. So first of all, there's the fruitfulness of being able to bear children. And then we see that these two sons go on to have different occupations. We're told that Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. So Abel is subduing the animals, which is what the first humans were told to do. And Cain is working the soil, which is what Adam is told to do in the garden. So they are fulfilling together the creation purpose for humanity, which is an encouraging sign. There is such a potential here for partnership. And then the next encouraging sign is that both of these young men bring offerings to Yahweh. So it seems as though there is a sense of um, living their lives as an act of worship and bringing God some of what he's provided for them. However, the story takes a discouraging turn when God accepts Abel in his offering but rejects Cain's offering. So many have wondered, why is Cain's offering rejected? Is it because Cain is bringing vegetables and Abel is bringing animals? So this prefigures the importance of blood sacrifice, animal sacrifice. I would say no. I think we're getting a subtle clue from the story when it says in verse 3, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to Yahweh, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. These, the, the difference between the two is subtle, but we're told that Cain simply brings some of his produce, whereas Abel brings the best of his produce. He's taking, he's taking his firstborns and he's taking the fat portions, which were highly valued and later would be designated for Yahweh in worship. So, so while Cain is just bringing something, Abel is bringing the best. And when God renders his assessment of their offerings, Cain is upset. He wanted the offering that he brought to be uh, seen as something more than what it actually was. He wanted to get some kind of kudos or credit for what he brought to God, even though he was only bringing God some of his offering, not the best of what he had. I would compare that to um, if you have neighbors who grow vegetable gardens in the summer and one of your neighbors offers to share zucchini with you, you would know that your neighbor has too much zucchini. People who share zucchini are generally not doing so out of the goodness of their heart. It's because it's impossible to grow just a little bit of zucchini, and no one can possibly eat all the zucchini that is grown. So somebody who shares their zucchini with you is giving you part of their leftovers more than what they can eat. And in a similar way, Cain is bringing God some of what he has, but it doesn't cost him anything the way Abel's offering costs him. Miroslav Volf talks about this passage in his book, 
in exclusion and embrace. And he has some really insightful things to say about it. He says, when God pronounced Abel better, Cain either had to readjust radically his identity or eliminate Abel. And that is, of course, what happens in the story. So rather than submitting to God's assessment of good and evil, Cain sets himself in opposition to God and to his brother. God actually comes to him when Cain is upset about the result of the offering. He approaches him and asks him questions, inviting him to respond. He invites Cain to repent and to master his sin. Here there's a really interesting connection with chapter 3. God explains to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. And here's the key part. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. The word desires and the word for rule is the same as we saw in Genesis 3.16. When God says to the woman, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. So we're seeing a reemergence of the same theme of tension. The unfortunate tension between husband and wife resulting from human rebellion in chapter 3 mirrors the ongoing tension between humans and sin. We, that sin tries to get the upper hand, but we need to subdue it. We need to master it. Instead of dominating his sin, Cain goes on to dominate his brother. When we're faced with our own sin, we always have a choice. Will we repent and agree with God's assessment of what we've done? Or will we rebel and try to recreate society in our image according to our definition of good and evil. And that is what happens as Cain proceeds. Uh, join me again next week and we'll consider the results of Cain's decision to eliminate his brother rather than repent. I hope all of you have a great week. <laughs>